You're here for one thing and one thing only, and that's to learn about gin and botanicals. We've got five incredible speakers for you today who are going to talk about uh, gin. We all have our own individual uh, botanicals that we want to talk about, and the particular, uh, I mean, we use most of them in our gins anyway. Uh, the one I'd like to talk about today is chamomile. Is somebody moving this? <laughs> this is great. Uh, so you can see this wee thing here. It's a, it's a board that I've got up in my botanical store, and it just tells you the different places in the world uh, where I buy the botanicals from. I have no idea where half these places are, because I'm colour blind and I have no idea what's land and what's country. But so that, that's uh, the people who set that up. Why they didn't they did that without asking me? I have no idea. Uh, chamomile. Now. There's one part in here, and hopefully you, you will see. Uh, it's, it's quite nice, it's, it's a nice sort of wee piece about it. Uh, the other ingredients in ca cam fruitiness. Where have they ever got that from? I have no idea. Fruitiness in chamomile flowers. Uh, it was just something that's, you know, advertising. They put in there and they think, yeah, it's fruity. Uh, chamomile flowers are certainly not fruity. Uh, actual chamomile flower itself, when you take the flower and you smell it, it's, it's just like a nice wee daisy. This is actually a German chamomile flower that you're seeing here. And the reason I know that is it's in a river. Uh, they, they particularly like uh, wet surfaces. Uh, Roman chamomile is particularly dry surfaces. But uh, people use these. The one I use, Roman chamomile, uh, and I think uh, Joanne Moore, uh, from uh, what's the gin? Goodness me, God, Greenwood, Green yes. Uh, and what's the bloody gin called? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> jo Joanne will be thinking, goodness me, why did they leave this at all? <laughs> uh, but Bloom Gin, uh, she uses, uh, uh, and she does claim that she is the only female master distiller in the world. Now, I can only assume this is for gin because I think there is other uh, master distillers, uh, female master distillers, and the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned, because uh, women in general have better noses than men. I don't think these guys will uh, agree with me, but uh, I would have to say. And in, in, in Bloom Gin, she uses chamomile, uh, honeysuckle, and pomelo. Now, the, the whole idea of this is it's a floral gin, just like Tanqueray number 10, the gin that I make. And that the chamomile is there just to give you a little a little lift when you actually nose it. The taste is nice and it's, it's nice and gentle. But chamomile flower itself is it's kind of being a little daisy, you smell it, there's not a lot there. If you break into it, unfortunately I didn't bring any samples today, I apologise for that. But if you break into it, the chamomile just bursts out. Now, you can imagine that when, when I'm distilling it, after about sort of, a, an hour into distillation, the heat and the still, the vaporisation, it just floods out. It's such a wonderful nose to get. It, it kicks in very early, and this is a, the whole idea of a floral type note to any gin is when you get it to start with. You put it to your nose and it's something different, it's there. We all know that uh, juniper uh, is, the, is the main ingredient in any gin. If it wasn't for juniper, we wouldn't be here. But we're allowed to add these extra ingredients in to give gin a lift. Bring it into a new sort of era. Let's stick with old, but we can move forward a wee bit. Uh, this is a sacro of gin. It, it doesn't look very interesting at all. Just dry wee flowers, but that's how I get it. And trust me, these wee flowers every single individual one and the plant itself the plant only has one uh, the sprigs only have one flower because German chamomile uh, they branch off as, as well these have the center of these are really thick and that's that's where you get the essential oils from it, the actual aroma from it, it it does burst out I can't talk too much about this because it's just I mean I love this 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 new flower it does so much to Tanqueray 10 uh, and Bloom Gin, I'm glad I remembered that again. Isn't that, isn't that horrendous? 
Uh, do you have another, or is that me sort of slide uh, I can pass on to? No. Next ten, that's my slide. Uh, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> the next slide, of course, is Charles, and, and he is going to talk about uh, uh, Juniper, of course, uh, which, like I say, if it wasn't for Juniper, we wouldn't be here. Uh, what more can I say, except uh, if you ever get the chance again and they get five of us, uh, please come because uh, we are so appreciative of the fact that you've came to us today and, and just to see us. And please, this is a one-time chance that you've got to ask questions at the end to any of us and make the, make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I don't know how I can follow that. <coughs> yeah. Got a couple of sheds down in Clapham, you know. And it, uh, <coughs> um, slight sort of amusing start to this when we were sort of having a telephone conference about right, what botanicals would we all talk about? Uh, people picking tea and people picking chamomile, and <coughs> somebody got quite excited about coriander seed and kept on going for a bit. And finally, I said, Well, I suppose somebody better talk about juniper because technically that's what gin's supposed to have most of in it. Um, so I ended up with Juniper, but it is a wonderful product because uh, it's been around for millennia. The human race has used it for thousands of years. Uh, you can trace back through all sorts of records, uh, obviously primarily uh, as a medicinal item. I mean, in 1269, the Nature Bloom uh, quotes, he who wants to be rid of stomach pain should use Juniper cooked in rainwater. He who has cramps cook juniper wine, it's good against pain. And in many ways, like so many botanicals, juniper's almost been used as a cure-all. Uh, it's certainly got diuretic properties. Um, there have been claims that it uh, uh, encourages the appetite, and equally that it suppresses the appetite. So there we are, it does everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, there is a certain amount of current research going on, quite serious research actually, uh, in the diabetes area because it has been found that actually juniper uh, encourages the release of, uh, of insulin from the pancreas. Um, so yeah, fairly soon diabetics are going to be able to whoops, um, drink, uh, excuse me, um, drink, drink, drink lots and lots of gin. Um, <laughs> Uh, and in one or two places, it's actually been suggested that it's uh, useful for women in the form of contraception. So, uh, there we go. Uh, um, now, uh, juniper is, um, uh, is, 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 is obviously the flavour that needs to be predominant in, spirit, in, in the spirit for it to be called gin. That's what the EU rules say. Um, so... Uh, what is used, why did we come to use it, and what are its properties? Juniper berries are not actually berries, uh, first fact. They're actually seed cones, because the juniper is a member of the uh, conifer family, uh, or uh, as I think they call it, gymnos gymnospermus plant. I think I pronounced that right, but I wouldn't know. Um, uh, <coughs> juniper basically is, of course, grown wild. Of all the botanicals we use, it's probably the one which is virtually, I and mean, people don't cultivate juniper, they go and pick it um, up on the hills in Tuscany, up on the hills in, uh, a very nice day last year, picking it up on the, well, no, watching it being picked, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's a damn good excuse for a good lunch. Um, um, but it is, it is grown wild, and indeed, part of the reason why uh, London gin Became so, became so well made is in fact before the first, up until the time of the First World War, there used to be a lot of juniper growing wild on the top of the Downs, the Chilterns and places like that during the First World War when the need for food grew dramatically uh, they uh, both either ploughed it up or otherwise they grazed it away uh, and nobody's bothered to uh, get back and, and, and plant any. Um, so it's a wild rather than a cultivated plant um, so it's been around and easy to do. Um, it's uh, not being a berry. It actually stores, if you've got a dry place, it stores easily, um, which is obviously an advantage when you've got something that's cropped once a year. It actually can be kept, once it's dry, it can be kept. And unlike 
most botan or a lot of botanicals, I shouldn't say most, a lot of botanicals, in the oils in it actually concentrate over time. They don't dissipate. I mean, if you have something, for instance, like say like ginger or citrus peels or things like that, they will lose their oils. They will actually lose their flavor. Juniper actually concentrates down. Um, the berries themselves, of course, actually are two years old when they're harvested. Um, and the interesting thing is when you walk around the, 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 the bushes where they're grown, you'll actually see sort of this year's crop and last year's crop, and they grow literally alongside to each other. Um, some ladies go along and give it a hell of a whacking with a stick. Don't get in their way because they'll give you a whacking otherwise. Um, putting their, uh, their, 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 their bits of sacking or whatever or their collection baskets below it, and they whack the bush and down come the berries. Uh, so it was something that was very easy uh, going back over the, over the centuries to actually keep once it had been cropped. Uh, it's property. Well, it is, you could say, of course, juniper is everything. That, you know, when you pick up a good glass of gin, the first thing you should see, the biggest thing you should find is juniper coming out of, at you. Um, piney notes, without doubt, resinous. Uh, it's a very heavy oil. It has certain citrus overtones to it. And that's why it marries so well with that other great gin botanical coriander seed. I won't talk too much about that because otherwise Peter will kill me because I might nick his, uh, his, his little call. Um, it's very heaviness uh, and it's very pungent and it's pininess was exactly what encouraged its use. If we go back to the days long before anybody had thought about making London dry gin with neutral spirit, and back in the days of, of the 17th and 18th century, when Mr. Coffey had, was, was not even a, 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 a sort of a, a shimmer in his mother's eye, neither was she at that point. Um, spirit, the quality of spirit coming off a lot of the stills was distinctly of second-rate nature. And an awful lot of the botanicals that were being put in the spirit at that time were as much put there to mask the impurities in the spirit as they were to actually add flavour to, 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 to the spirit and to make the gin. And juniper was ideal for that because it, it would do an awful lot of that. Uh, once, of course, Mr Coffey came along, uh, the distiller, we were at last liberated, we could actually get real neutral spirit and we could actually play around with the botanicals specifically to flavour the spirit rather than to mask impurities. And juniper was the one that really made it to the top of the hill. And it's, it, it's very nature also makes it so great uh, to be in a, in a spirit which is essentially a mixer. It's a gin's never really been made to be drunk neat. Um, in the old days, okay, it was drunk with water, it was drunk as pinks, pink gin, uh, items like that. It was never made to be drunk neat. And the advantage of juniper is that it marries up with other flavours and it never really gets subjugated. Any good gin cocktail, any good drink, you should still find the gin and the juniper coming out at you. Right. Um, yeah, there's the lady with the stick. I feel like she can't have given her a lot. Um, should we move on a little bit to licorice? Licorice, fascinating, really fascinating botanical. Gets spelt in various ways. Um, that's the sort of English way. Um, the other way is with a C and no U. Um, it's been used in food for literally thousands of years. Uh, also known as sweet root um, because it contains a compound it's about 50 times sweeter than sugar in it. Um, like juniper, uh, it has, and so many botanicals, it's been called uh, on to treat a wide variety of illnesses over the years. Uh, what is true that in medicine, uh, it acts as a, uh, a demulcent or, or a soothing and coating agent. And I'll return to this in a few minutes. Licorice also has the active ingredient of glycerhyzine, glycerhyzine. Uh, now this is a bit of a two-edged sword, uh, specifically in the USA they get very excited about that any chance that glycerhyzine acid might be in it. Um, so far, rather like almonds, everything has indicated that it, that does not pass on distillation, um, which is a uh, great relief to an awful lot of uh, gin producers because licorice is found in a uh, huge number of gins. Um, it grows wild, uh, but it is also cultivated. 
Uh, and it's the root that actually gets used in, in the gin. Um, yeah, there you, get, you see it becomes very neat just before you put it in the gin. Um, it can be used either in root form in, in gin distillation or in powder form. And again, the interesting thing is that the two give slightly different flavour properties to the gin. If you use one or the other, um, you can use, have exactly the same recipe. If you put the powder in, you'll get one flavour profile. If you put the root in, the side root in, you get another profile. Uh, as I said, um, it's been used as a cure for many ills, uh, ulcers, canker sores, eczema, indigestion, even weight loss. So here we go again, you see, you can drink gin and lose weight. Can't be bad. Uh, mind the tonic, however. Um, licorice to gin brings uh, us some of its smoothing and coating agent properties. It really is something which, which adds as a softener into gin and a smoother. Uh, and it also adds complex sweet notes. Uh, outside you'll find, uh, amongst the gins there, there's Bermondsey Old Tom Gin. Now the interesting <coughs> thing about that, everybody thinks Old Tom Gin is made using sugar. A lot of them were, but some of them weren't, and indeed some of the ones that went to the USA traditionally didn't. Um, sugar was uh, always an expensive property back in the old days because sugar, sugar and tea, of course, the two things on which the British Empire was built. That's where all the money was. Um, licorice was, a, was considerably cheaper and gave the same, a lot of similar properties. And if you try uh, the, the old Tom Gin out there, the Bermondsey old Tom Gin, you will see, you'll get really get an, a, an illustration of what a stack of licorice in a gin will do. It has no sugar in it. It certainly acts as a smoothing. There are slight sweet notes. It also delivers, I actually think, it, it, it's a very earthy quality to the, to the gin. Um, it's one of the few gins where the licorice is probably sort of somewhere like, um, ooh, up to about two-thirds of the amount of juniper that's in there. So it, it's very, very heavily uh, uh, licorice. Um, and really, that in many ways deals with, the, as I say, the, the, with, with licorice. Um, it is, it's, it, you'll find it in, in a lot of gins in greater or lesser extent, and really it, it's its smoothing, smoothing nature that we use it for. Thank you very much. You may not have heard of, of uh, Alcohols Limited, um, but we are a major player in the London dry gin market, but we don't have a brand. So we make for other private labels, um, around about 80 uh, at the moment. Uh, we have a team of four distillers with about 85 years experience between us. And our distillery is in Langley in the black country just outside of Birmingham. So today I'm here and delighted to speak about two very different botanicals used in all, certainly the majority of London dry gins, and that is orris root powder and coriander seed. Isn't it? Very pretty, isn't it? Orris root. Uh, orris root powder comes from the stem, the underground stem of the Florentine iris plant, and that is the, the plant uh, there. Um, as my fellow distillers would agree, or hope would agree, it's the most expensive botanical regularly used in London dry gin. Frighteningly expensive, in fact. So, where are they grown and how are they cultivated? Florentine I iris has been grown since about 1700 <coughs> and is grown in the olive groves and vineyards of Tuscany in northern Italy. The best quality will come from fine and sandy soil. The ground is drier, the lack of water makes them easier to cultivate and they are cultivated in a very labour-intensive and manual way. The plants are planted in August and they grow for three years before they can be cultivated and the best yield will come in the third year of cultivation. August is definitely the best time for the collection as it's the driest month and the plants are very simply dug up by hand with a spade. The stems and the leaves are then cut off with scissors and the rooted cuttings are then replanted back into the ground within three or four weeks. Now the underground root stem, as you can see on the left hand side of that uh, photograph, is called a rhizome and that's now ready to be processed uh, into orris root powder. 
the loose roots, as you can see here on the right hand side of them, snips away with a knife. Again, very manual, very labour intensive. And the stem is then, for example, thrown into a concrete mixer with some water and some stones. And that's turned on, and round and round she goes. This will clean the uh, stems, but will also aid the removal of the skin from the root stem. It's then dried in the open air, cut into pieces or sliced, and then left to dry again. Then the really labour intensive part of it is, is finished off by hand with a knife, removing all the skin, a bit like peeling a potato, and then it's dried for a third time in the open air. Finally, it's ground into a powder, as you can see there, and that's where we come in to use it in London Dry Gin. So what does Oris root powder bring to the party? Well, it has a wonderful, delicate aroma. It's very floral, as you can imagine. It's very fragrant. It's a bit like a blend of violet, palm violet sweets, if you're old enough to remember those, and tea, some sweet teas. And this aroma, the floral and flavoured of uh, fragrant aroma increases during the period that it's drying. So it's really important for these root stems to be bone dry before they're powdered. Oris root powder also acts as a binding agent. It also binds the other botanicals flavours together. Um, there are a couple of botanicals uh, used in London Dry Gin that will do this, um, Angelica root being the other. So in summary, it's very expensive, it's time consuming to harvest, but the result is definitely worth it, as it adds so many complex and fragrant and delicate uh, additives to London Dry Gin. So this is Oris root powder. Now we're going to move on to the one, as Charles said, I selected to talk about. Coriander. <coughs> coriander, as you know, is also called cilantro, which is the Spanish word for coriander. And it's the second most crucial botanical after the juniper berries. Coriander is a strange animal because it's also a herb and a spice at the same time and it comes from the same family as the carrot. It's one of the... Sorry, Nick. And again. Okay, so the history of coriander. It is one of the earliest spices used by man. Traced back to about 5,000 years BC. In fact, coriander seeds were put in urns in the Egyptian pyramids, in the tombs. It was also used by the Romans and the Greeks as a medicine, same as the majority of the botanicals we hear about today. Um, and it was used as a stimulant and an aphrodisiac. So it's quite handy to have. So where, where is coriander produced? It's grown all over the world, but mainly in southern and eastern Europe, North Africa, Southwest Asia, especially India, and it's an annual plant. And there are two types of coriander. One is called a macrocarpum, which has a huge seed, about three to five millimeters each, and they're mainly grown in India and they're used for spices for your, for your cooking. The microcarpum is grown here in uh, Europe, it's much smaller, it's only one and a half to three millimeters across, and has a much more intensive amount of oils inside it. The larger seeds have 0.1 to 0.4 percent of oil. The smaller seeds, 0.4 to 1.8 percent of oil. And this is crucial for us as gin distillers. We want lots and lots of essential oils. The, my view, the uh, the best producer, uh, producing area is Bulgaria. Um, basically I've just come back from there after doing my shopping for uh, next year's coriander. It has a much higher uh, oil content than other European producing areas. So, the production starts in February, March, the coriander is planted and after three weeks the plants will emerge. The growing season for coriander is about 140 days and during that time the plant will reach between 50 and 80 centimetres. And they're harvested by using a, a small combine harvester. It's quite rough, rough and ready. They're just ripped out of the ground. Um, each plant will hold about 300 seeds. 
and of those seeds they are split, it's a bit of a pun, but split between whole seeds and half seeds or split seeds. The split seeds then go back in for replanting the, uh, the plants, the whole seeds are what we're after. And you can see, sorry, you can see that you have split and whole seeds and debris as well from the uh, ground as they're harvested. Okay. Rather a wonderful piece of kit. The most important thing for us is to separate those three items, the splits, the whole seeds and the debris. And they're put into a, um, a cylindrical separator, um, which is very old fashioned. And basically the, the whole seeds will fall out of the bottom. But there is further work to be done uh, after this um, process. If you can go to the next one. So this is the whole seeds, the odd split in there. And to the next one, Nick, please. This is a brutal piece of equipment. This is a grader. Uh, so the seeds will come in, fed into the grader, and they will be graded down to individual sizes because some of the seeds on the plant won't have matured and are too small. So what we're aiming for is a very uniform size of seeds. Now, how does it come into London Dry Gin? Well, as you can see, it's a very small seed, so we need huge volumes of it. Tens of thousands of tonnes, in fact, for the UK. And this year's crop, sorry gentlemen, is about half what it normally is. So coriander is very hard uh, to get hold of uh, for next year. It gives us dry and slightly bitter spice to a gin as opposed to a sweeter spice that you would get from something like cassia bark or from cinnamon bark. And it acts as a counterbalance against the juniper. As Charles said, juniper is the predominant flavour. It doesn't get taken over by anything else, but you need the coriander in just to keep the, the juniper down a, a little bit. Therefore, some gins will have a higher coriander content, which when you add angelica root, for example, is a very dry, dry gin, which some parts of the world love. Or you can have a lower coriander uh, content with a higher juniper content, throw in a bit of citrus, and that gives a much sweeter offering. So the options are endless by <coughs> balancing out those two ingredients. So in summary, it gives us many, many options on the styles of gin that we produce. And it's crucial to the UK's premium spirit, London Dry Gin. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Peter. I think we're all a bit envious of you nipping over to Eastern Europe and grabbing all the remaining coriander seed. <laughs> it is a tough year. Um, some years it's juniper, um, obviously you know, grown wild and harvested um, by hand. This year it's coriander. Um, who knows, next year it might be something else. Uh, but I'm going to talk about uh, citrus, first of all. Because um, I think after juniper, that essential botanical in all gin, and the pretty much ubiquitous coriander, I find it hard to think of a gin without coriander. Um, those who make 80 gins probably can think of some without coriander. But after those two... Uh, I think citrus is probably uh, the next most popular used uh, botanical in the creation of gin. Um, so why? What does it do? What's the purpose of it? First of all, um, you don't need citrus. All you need is juniper. And there are some excellent gins, um, Tom's tank being one of them, uh, that doesn't use citrus at all. Uh, so it's not essential, but it, what does it do? What does it bring to the party? I think the great thing about gin, when you compare it to other spirits, is that there are so many different elements that bring flavour. And the art of the distillers is to actually get them in balance uh, so that they complement each other and work together. Um, so juniper, that essential note. But citrus, I think, brings some of the more upfront um, clean, fresh, sharper notes to gin. Um, coriander, that spicy note. I, if I look at all the many, many gins that are out there now and try and put them in some sort of category, uh, it's pretty difficult. I try to keep a library of gins at the distillery, but uh, 
I can't give up. There's so many new ones at the moment. Um, the, the sort of standard headings that I would give them are juniper lead, um, citrus lead, and then you get spice lead, uh, and herb, and floral. That's five, actually. Uh, and they all kind of fall into one of those categories, but will have elements of the other things as well. So citrus, clean, fresh, up front. Um, there is a huge range of different types of citrus out there. Uh, traditionally, orange and lemon. Uh, they're the ones we most usually see in gins, uh, certainly the more traditional brands. Um, and again, where they come from, what particular type of citrus they are, what type of orange they are, all make a difference. I think the one thing that I've learned as a distiller over a few years is that small changes can actually make a big difference in, in, the, in the finished product. Um, so, orange, probably the most common. Actually, maybe lemon is more common than orange. Um, where, where it comes from, you know, the Italian lemon is different to the Spanish lemon and so on. Due to climate, due to oil content, it's those volatile oils that distill and contribute the flavour to the gin. Um, orange, uh, for beef eater we use the bitter orange, the seville orange. Other gins use sweet orange. So again, they make a difference. Um, I think it was Charles that mentioned that when you're distilling, when you're talking about juniper, um, those notes are very much um, the keynote flavours in gin. But when we distill all these botanicals, they all come across at different stages of distillation. And that's why gin is so different to other spirits. There are so many more ingredients. Whiskey is made from grain. Um, rum is made from sugar cane. Brandy is made from the grape. Gin is made from juniper plus whatever you want. Uh, I think the, the expression is as long as it's decent, honest and legal. Uh, I'm waiting for the first gin that isn't quite legal. It won't be me, obviously, but uh, you know, there's a huge range of botanical materials out there. Um, so citrus um, really, really changes it. And when we're distilling, all those botanicals come one after another. And if you come to the, the beef eater distillery first thing in the morning, the aroma is, the atmosphere is full of citrus. It's more volatile, it needs less heat to drive off the flavours. And that's the first flavour we've got. Uh, and then we get juniper, then we get coriander, and so on. So it runs through the range of flavours and the botanicals, kind of one after another. So you have to be quite careful how you, how you collect them. Uh, but the, the end product should be, hopefully, a, a harmonious and balanced combination of all the botanicals that have been in there. Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons that... Um, citrus works in gin, or maybe it's all the way around, so many of the classic cocktails use citrus, um, normally lemon juice, as one of the ingredients. And, you know, there's a connect. The interesting thing about gin, as a gin distiller, I'm very much aware of the fact that what I make is actually not the way anyone drinks it. Something else has happened. It may be as simple as a gin and tonic or a more complex cocktail. But gin is, because it's so versatile, with all these different flavours. It can be led in whichever direction the competent bartender wants to take it. Um, I would slightly dispute Charles's claim that uh, gin has to be dr drunk with something else, um, because we've just launched a, a sipping gin with, uh, with Burroughs Reserve, but that's, that's another story for another day. <laughs> um, but I think Nonetheless, the, the evidence of a good gin is that you can actually drink it on its own. It may not be how you wish to drink it, but if it has its own integrity, its own balance, then it will work in other directions for other people. Um, so orange and lemon are the most common. Um, I did a little bit of research because I, I seem to recall other citruses being used. And of course, I remember that I used grapefruit uh, in, in, in Beefy to 24. And I, I went through um, Gary Regan's book earlier on just to see where else I could find references to citrus. And I found, apart from lemon and orange, tangerine, mandarin, clementine, grapefruit, lime, bergamot, actually nearly all of those in Larios 12, which has a, out of its 12 botanicals, six of them are citrus. 
So, you know, there's a massive range of styles and varieties of citrus. They all have their own part to play. Um, but what they do is to give uh, variety to the gin. So, back to the question about gin being predominantly juniper, which is what it's required to be by European law. Um, it's difficult. I, I used to work for Plymouth Gin, and when I moved up from Plymouth to Beefeater, the thing I really understood about Beefeater was it was very much citrus-led, um, particularly orange. Um, so does that mean it's not predominantly juniper? It's a rotten definition, by the way, to say predominantly juniper by taste, because we're all going to taste differently. But, you know, there needs to be evidence of juniper there. Um, and it's because citrus is so volatile, it will always show first. It doesn't mean there's more of it, but it's got sharper elbows in the queue. It comes to the front quite quickly. So that, that citrus note you tend to get at the beginning uh, is because it's more volatile, not necessarily because there's more of it. So we're gin. Um, so a huge range, huge style uh, from Spain, from all over Europe. Uh, gins that are made overseas would, obviously American gins would probably use uh, citrus in Florida. I think it's a bit of a problem importing citrus into the States. I've had it confiscated from me in the past. Um, but a hugely important uh, style in the development of, of gin, in giving that complexity, that balance of flavours. Um, the other thing I want to talk about uh, is tea, because having said that a good gin is a balance of flavours that complement each other and work together, um, about five, six years ago, uh, I was tasked to produce a new gin for Beef Eater, which turned out as uh, a Beef Eater 24. Um, and, okay, a new gin, wanted to do something different. Uh, hopefully not for the sake of being different, but just to see how uh, you alter the balance of flavours by introducing a different element of flavour. And uh, I decided to use tea um, because tea actually works well with gin. Um, forget the pun of gin, G and T for a moment. It's, this is tea leaf. Um, I, I was actually in, in, in Japan, and in those days, the tonic water didn't contain quinine. Uh, it was banned in, in foodstuffs. Quinine basically is, is a medicinal uh, uh, herbal drug, so it wasn't allowed in foodstuffs. So, although my gin was, was fine, uh, my tonic water was different without quinine, so my gin and tonic was different, so I'm not happy. So what else can I put in my gin? Gin, that great mixable drink. Um, maybe I wasn't quite in the mood for a Negroni at that particular second. I can't think why, but I wasn't. Um, what was around me in terms of soft drinks? Soft drinks, tea. Green tea, iced lemon tea, that kind of thing. So, okay, what happens if I put tea in my gin as an alternative to tonic? Could have used grapefruit juice or lots of other flavours. Uh, and it actually works very well. Um, so I thought, why not use tea in distillation? Uh, what will happen? So I did a lot of research on teas, and I ended up using two teas. One is this uh, a Japanese sencha tea. Sencha is a process. Um, what happens is when they pick the leaf, they put steam through it to prevent it from oxidizing. So it stays as green tea. And um, uh, lots of teas in China and in, in Japan and Taiwan are made in that sencha method. Um, and what I was looking for was some flavor that was compatible with the other flavors in the gin. And I think what I learned from that exercise, by this time I'd been making gin for 40 years, but always somebody else's, you know, the founder's recipe. Um, as, as we're all tasked with doing in many brands. Um, but the introduction of tea, and this is very important in the way that drinks work, what it did was not just to add tea as a flavour to the other botanicals that were there, but it actually changes the relationship between the other botanicals. So in that respect, 2 plus 2 doesn't always make 4 when you're dealing with flavours. Any of you who are involved in, in making mixed drinks and cocktails will understand that, you know, that drop more lemon juice or um, sugar syrup will suddenly change the balance of the drink. And to keep it the same is a hard thing. We could all make something different, but being 
consistently the same. Go into a bar and order the same drink three times in different bartenders, see if it comes out the same. That's the ultimate challenge. Great fun doing that. <laughs> um, so it changes the relationship between the other botanicals in the way that all the other botanicals do as well. And the secret, the art, the skill, is to get something that's harmonious, that balances, that complement each other, uh, and create something totally different from similar botanicals. There are lots of gins, um, you know, from the five of us here, that use very, very similar botanicals in our recipes. But in addition to the botanicals, the way you make the gin has a big significance. And those little differences with similar botanicals can make an incredibly different style of gin. So complex um, and variable and useful to use. There's a tea garden, is that the word? Um, the other gin, uh, the other, sorry, the other tea that I use is a, uh, a Chinese green tea. They both have different characteristics and it's how they work together. It's introducing, if you like, a new member to the family. It changes that family relationship and hopefully it's uh, welcomed in. I, I, talking to uh, the wonderful Tony Canigliaro, who runs the uh, uh, Colbrook 69 bar and the drink factory, he explained to me why tea works. And it's because the molecular structure of tea is such, it's got big molecules, um, is such that it attaches very successfully to other flavours. That's why we see out in Covent Garden here, you'll see shops using, selling soap and cosmetics made with tea and drinks made with tea and hopefully some gin made with tea, cocktails made with tea. It's a very versatile product because its molecular structure makes it attractive and amenable to other flavours. Um, same will apply to any other botanical, but I just wanted to give those two uh, as an example. So we're well on the way now, we've probably covered five or six botanicals to probably the next new gin will help us. Thank you. Stunned. Where do I go from here? I guess that's the big question I have to ask. Um, huge amount of knowledge, um, background in distillation. Um, and I was thinking about where do I go? I've got Angelica, which, do you know what? I've really enjoyed investigating and, and further researching. Um, but I've also got spice as well. And for me, spice, young, fresh, vibrant, invigorating. So what I'd like to do is just take you through Angelica, uh, which I really rate as a, as a botanical. It's got such great uses. And also take you through some of the medicinal and medical areas of it, and then take you through some of the spices. Then after that, I want to kind of renew the contract we as distillers have with you uh, as consumers, mixologists. So first of all, moving on to Angelica. Um, Angelica, Archangelica, Holy Ghost, Wild celery. All these are names that we've had for uh, this particular plant or botanical. Um, herbaceous, perennial, or biennial. Um, there's 60 uh, different types of angelica in, in the family group. However, we're just going to be focusing on angelica, archangelica. Now, it grows uh, in all of uh, northern uh, Europe uh, and Asia, um, and it likes damp uh, growth areas. It flourishes, and on the second year of planting, it comes up with umbrals of white and greenish flowers. Um, and then from that, they can be harvested once they die back. Now, it's such a versatile botanical. Um, it has been used throughout the whole of history in many, many areas. So, for instance, the seeds are quite often used um, as, a, as a fragrance for gin. But more than just gin, chartreuse, uh, or also vermouth as well. So they're used in there, so it's a very versatile seed. Moving down to the, to the stem, if you want. Um, <laughs> I, I think this is quite fun, but it apparently it tastes very nice with reindeer milk. Okay, so there's other aspects of how it's been used, but also the Sami people in Lapland use it as a musical instrument. Uh, it's also crystallized uh, and used as a, con uh, as a sweet. So it's got a great, great use there. Moving down to the roots. Now the roots have a, have a wonderful place in history. Um, they've been used um, when they've been freshly mushed and boiled uh, for wounds as a dressing, so both externally and internally. Okay, they've also been used as a succulent food, uh, sweet, also delivering calorific benefits. Um, but it's the aromas that we get from all of these. Now, as the 60, 
there are 60 different profiles in aroma, some more citrus-led, some less citrus-led. But it's the pungent, aromatic, musky aroma, some you will also link with juniper that you get from the angelica root, which really, really kind of involves me and infuses me. When you actually go to, to purchase this, the aroma as you smell and crunch, it, it's just wonderful. It's a really earthy uh, botanical. So for me, uh, Angelica, Archangelica is a beautiful botanical. Now, where's it been all this time? Uh, I find some of the other uses really fantastic for this. So for instance, it was smoked as a cure for asthma. Now, smoking and a cure for asthma, I always find it's quite interesting. But it, it, was, it was there. It was also used um, for urinary tract infections. It was also used for other aspects of that. So it's got a real history. So Angelica, all the way through gin and gin distillation, has, has a great root and great versatility. So moving on to the next one, which is my first spice. Piper cubeb, um, or um, tail pepper. OK, now for me, this, um, goodness me, it's a real roller coaster botanical. If you take one um, of the pepper grains and you crunch it between your teeth, you get a huge avalanche of flavours just coming through. So for instance, first of all, you get the peppery notes that come through. And then for me, uh, as Desmond quite rightly said, there's different people that experience flavours in a different way. But for me, I get a menthol, sort of eucalyptus. And then I go through to lavender. And then I get some of the resurgence of the peppery notes coming through. So all in all, I think it's an absolutely stunning, vibrant botanical. Uh, and sits very well uh, within uh, gin distillation. So, where's it been used before? Okay, um, cubeb berries has got a great history. Again, smoked for asthma, smoked for curing the phlegm. It was used as a fertility treatment as well. So, it's, it's had, a, had a great uh, history throughout medicine and medicine coming through. And I guess that's what we're all saying is a lot of the basis and fundamentals of. of botanicals we're using in our genes today. So, Piper Cuba. Um, <coughs> where did it come from? Um, in Java. Okay, is the, is the most significant uh, section of growth there. Um, and it's grown, um, it is cultivated, but then harvested, harvested prematurely, blanched mainly, so that often uh, you won't get uh, the seeds that uh, you can use uh, to grow. But it was used extensively in the 1600s as a substitute for pepper. Um, and then as pepper became, or, or um, Piper Niger, uh, as it became through, uh, became more common, was then removed from uh, in common use. So, a lovely and versatile uh, botanical. So, moving on to the next one, please. Ah, uh, Cinnamomum cassia. Now, not many people know this, but there's four different types of uh, cinnamon or, or cassia, if you want. Now, the first one is um, the common one, which we, we've all used, and has a great history with gin, gin distillation, and I'll get to that in a minute. But there's four different types. So there's Chinese cassia, which is Cassimomum cassia, or Cinnamomum cassia. The second one is Ceylon cassia. Okay. Uh, third one um, is Indonesia. And, and then you have um, got Saigon cassia as well. So there's four different types. Now, they all have a slightly different profile. But for me, again, as I said, taste um, and aroma, interpretation is all very wide and different. But for me, it's a lovely, delicate, yet pungent, aromatic cinnamon flavour that's really quite delicate but warming. And hence, that comes into how we taste it and where it's been used before. So medicines, it's used for coughs and colds and warming, which I think is wonderful. So it's actually a cultivated plant. And so what happens now um, in China uh, is... Um, basically, the farmers will take seedlings and they cultivate it, uh, and then they'll plant them out into the wet um, uplands. Uh, and what they'll do then is, after a year, they'll coppice them. And then from that root, you have ten shoots. So in about ten years' time after that, you simply peel the bark. Now, different uh, cassias or cinnamomums, uh, you may beat them and then peel back to, to produce quills, or you can simply grind them. So again, it's very versatile. Um, gin... Distillation. Now, I always think it's quite fun because looking at um, the cassia, originally uh, mixed with goose fat, the Romans used to perfume themselves. And it was once said uh, in the Roman Empire that anyone who didn't smell of cinnamon and goose fat obviously wasn't a true Roman. So that was one of the earliest ones. But going forward from there, um, it was then used um, for sweets. 
for confectioneries, etc. Now, Salon uh, was a great place for Cassia, and then the Dutch in 1638 started to take over Salon and remove the Portuguese from there. And I guess that's kind of where the interaction with gin, gin distillation may have come from, especially with London gin. So, for instance, uh, they came in by 1640, they'd taken over uh, basically all of the um, Salon production of, of Cassia. After that, the English went in uh, and also uh, developed uh, further cultivation of cassia, bringing it back into the UK. Kind of fell out of fashion when uh, chocolates, confectioneries became slightly more prevalent. But for me, it's got a very, very affectionate place in my heart. It's a lovely warming um, botanical, which, which is great on a winter's night when it's slightly warmed. Go to the next one, please. Aframomum melagueta, or Grace Paradise. Now, this is an interesting one for me. Um, personally speaking, it's a fiery number. Love it. Put a little one between your teeth, grind it up, and you get this huge rush of spice, but also citruses coming through. So it's a very, very versatile. And this one stays with you. It lingers, tantalizing, tingling your tongue. So for me, it's a lovely botanical to put in there. So it has great echoes. Two, three, four, five minutes later, after you've had that first sip, you've still got the echo and the sensations in your tongue and mouth. Wonderful. Um, it's harvested um, when it's not mature. It's then ripened. It's then beaten. The seeds are extracted, sifted, and then produced. And this was the reason why the west coast of Africa was actually called the Pep Coast, because this was the main product that was exported. Uh, it's not just Ghana now. Uh, it reaches down to the northern parts of Ethiopia. But again, great versatility. And it's a lovely botanical to have that. As I said, the echoes of the pepper tingling on your tongue. So, just one more, I believe. Oh, sorry, no. That was, uh, we're not going through that. So those are the four ones that I'm, I'm looking at in particular today. Um, and I was sat here and I was challenged with where do I go after to these four experts? And for me, um, we've spoken about our gins, and that's kind of our part of the deal. The next part of the deal is with you guys. How would we suggest servings? How do you suggest servings for us? Our role is consistency. It's quality, okay? That quality is exactly the same as. So that's our kind of part of the bargain. So for yourselves, how would you taste? How would you consume? How would you enjoy? Sam Carter and I were just having a, a bit of fun with this, and we're thinking about the angelica being used to flavour reindeer milk. So let's think about, perhaps, a, a walk down gin lane, where we've got uh, Bombay Sapphire, uh, we've got um, 20 mils of Arget, a syrup, and then we've got warm milk, and warmed up and served with a bit of cinnamon. So it's wonderful, it's bringing through with the spices. But it's a new kind of reinvention of how we would serve. It's coming up to the winter, what a great idea. And for Sam and I, it was about fun. It was about enjoying the products, and it was about young vitality, and seeing how we could recreate some of the traditional ones. Again, for me, a martini. Wow, what a great drink. Coming back into Angelica, of course, Angelica used uh, the seeds. Uh, are used often in, in the vermouth. So for me, a very, very dry martini. But also, with Bombay Sapphire, it brings out the peppers and the echoes. So wonderful, wonderful way to enjoy our products. And that is the challenge that we all have here. Not just for consistency, but how we consume, how we reinvent. And that is the partnership we both have. And that's it for me. Thank you.